The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone, who is able to join us today for our new webinar, uh, Blood Viscosity. Today, we have a special guest, um, Dr. Gregory D. Sloop. Dr. Gregory Sloop is the Associate Professor of Pathology at Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine and also the author and editor of his book, Blood Viscosity, Its Role in Cardiovascular Pathophysiology and Hematology. He also has 53 peer-reviewed publications on PubMed and is a former chairman of pathology and laboratory director at Benefits Hospital in Great Falls, Montana. He was also the associate professor of pathology at Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans. He enjoys living with six cats, two of whom are blind, is a mad scientist in the kitchen, and most importantly, understands the importance of blood viscosity. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and hand the mic over to Dr. Sloop, and Dr. Sloop, you can begin. Thank you, Grace, and I'd like to thank everybody for uh, tuning in to the webinar. Uh, I will bet most of you all have probably not thought of blood viscosity before. Uh, I hope to uh, educate you all to how vitally important blood viscosity is in sickness and in health. Okay, uh, I call it the uh, most unappreciated driving force in all of medicine. And uh, I say that because it's basically overlooked. Uh, when I went to med school, I never heard the term blood viscosity once. Uh, and uh, so it, it's very unfairly neglected. Uh, I think the a lot of attention has been paid to blood viscosity or an increasing amount of attention is being paid right now because uh, of thrombosis that's occurring with great frequency in COVID-19 patients. Uh, my colleagues and I have been writing about the role of blood viscosity in this thrombosis for about a month, uh, writing various letters in response to publications about thrombosis in uh, medical journals, uh, but it's only recently, I think, that uh, it's starting to dawn on the medical community at large how important blood viscosity is in determining uh, the incidence, the sky-high incidence of thrombosis in critically ill COVID patients. Uh, the first publication I know of, uh, I think it came out last Friday, uh, and that showed plasma viscosity, which is uh, not quite as good of a marker of the risk of thrombosis as blood viscosity is, but we'll talk about that. Uh, I think uh, before COVID-19, the uh, most important clinical application of blood viscosity was in coronary heart disease. Uh, blood viscosity uh, increased blood viscosity is the most important cause of atherosclerosis, which is the lesion which causes coronary artery disease. And we'll talk much more about that. Uh, because blood viscosity is overlooked, the medical community focuses more on cholesterol, oxidized LDL, one of those type of lipid molecules. Uh, but ask yourself how much progress in controlling the disease as our uh, efforts that are directed at cholesterol and lipid abnormalities. How much good has that done us? You know, statins are very commonly used and they'll lower your cholesterol. But uh, in the time since statins have been used, heart attacks have become the number one cause of death in, on the entire planet. Atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease is not controlled. And the reason why is because the role of blood viscosity is overlooked. Um, think about uh, a disease that is controlled. For example, scurvy. You never see people with scurvy because the cause of scurvy, vitamin D deficiency is recognized. That disease is controlled. 
coronary heart disease is nowhere near being controlled. And the reason for that is because blood viscosity is overlooked. Most of you have probably heard of metabolic syndrome. It's variably uh, defined, but uh, most commonly it's uh, felt to be uh, the combination of obesity, high blood pressure, elevated lipids, um, and elevated blood sugar. Uh, and most people will tell you that the cause of metabolic syndrome is unknown. Well, it's due to elevated blood viscosity. Anemia of chronic disease is uh, the single most common anemia in clinical practice. And uh, again, medical science does not understand what causes the anemia of chronic disease or chronic inflammation. And the reason for that is because the role of blood viscosity is overlooked. Clinically, it is measured very, very, very rarely. And uh, for all practical purposes, it's invisible. But uh, this shouldn't be. Viscosity is a fundamental property of all fluids, including blood. And uh, in particular, elevated blood viscosity uh, imparts an increased tendency for blood to clot or more properly thrombose. And uh, complications of thrombosis include COVID-19, and coronary heart disease. Perfusion, which is uh, the amount of blood which actually goes to tissue, organs and tissue, is inversely proportional to blood viscosity. The higher the blood viscosity, the less perfusion of all tissue. This is, uh, of course, important in peak athletic performance to supply the maximum amount of oxygen and glucose to skeletal muscle. You need uh, maximum perfusion and increased blood viscosity decreases perfusion. And uh, so that uh, decreases glucose uptake and can result in hyperglycemia. We'll talk more about that. And uh, blood viscosity, I think it's uh, intuitive. The thicker the blood, the more resistance it will impart to flow. So blood viscosity contributes to high blood pressure or hypertension. It's not the sole cause. Uh, hypertension is not, it's incompletely understood at this point, but uh, the lack of awareness of the role of blood viscosity makes the uh, lack of awareness that much greater. Now, a uh, little bit of chemistry. Blood is a colloid, which means it's basically a suspension of uh, particles, uh, including red blood cells or erythrocytes, the white blood cells, many of which uh, phagocytize uh, microbes. But uh, in the past 20 years or so, it's become clear that there are circulating stem cells. These are cells which can differentiate along any number of lines, uh, and those circulate at very low frequency in the blood. We'll talk more about that. Platelets are also uh, important in forming clots. It's a formed element of blood. And all of these elements are suspended in plasma, which is uh, the, uh, the liquid that uh, has uh, sodium, uh, chloride, a little bit of potassium. So it's a colloid. Blood is a non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, it is a shear thinning fluid, meaning that its viscosity decreases with an increasing rate of shear. And uh, there are a couple of phenomena which uh, add to the non-Newtonian behavior of blood. At low shear rates, erythrocytes tend to aggregate. Uh, we're going to talk about this quite a lot, and it causes blood viscosity to increase exponentially at low shear rates. Uh, the chemical term for erythrocyte aggregation would be flocculation. Every other colloid, uh, uh, this behavior is called flocculation. In blood, we call it erythrocyte aggregation. Uh, at the high shear rates, 
uh, blood viscosity decreases in part because of erythrocyte deformability. And we're going to talk more about that later on. The most important, the most powerful variable in determining blood viscosity is the hematocrit. And hematocrit is the uh, percentage of blood which is taken up by formed elements, almost entirely red blood cells. The normal hematocrit is about 45%. So if you take a column of blood in a centrifuge and spin it, uh, and that column is, say, uh, one centimeter tall, uh, 4.5 uh, millimeters of that one centimeter column is going to be uh, red blood cells normally. So that's the hematocrit, the percentage of blood composed of formed elements. And as you can imagine, the hematocrit uh, is going to be the most powerful determinant of blood viscosity because uh, it's obviously formed elements are going to flow less easily than liquid elements. And here's a chart that uh, demonstrates the uh, non Newtonian behavior of blood. Uh, as you go to the left, blood viscosity increases, and you can see the curve gets steep at very, very low shear rates, which is the horizontal axis. axis. And as you uh, move to the right, viscosity decreases with increasing shear rates. And I like to think of basically two different shear domains in blood, high shear and low shear, low shear being about 10 inverse seconds or less, high shear being 100 inverse seconds are more. Uh, and as you can see on the chart, erythrocyte aggregation is an important contributor to the viscosity of blood at low shear. These erythrocyte aggregates are weak and easily dispersed, um, and so they only form where blood flow is slow. Uh, but when blood flow is slow, these aggregates can form. That increases blood viscosity, which will slow flow even further, and you can get a vicious cycle, which we will talk about more later on. Um, I draw your attention to plasma proteins. Fibrinogen is a very important uh, uh, contributor to blood viscosity. We're going to talk more about fibrinogen later on. Inflam inflammatory factors uh, are a group of proteins also known as acute phase reactants. These proteins are produced by the liver in, in the inflammatory process. We're going to have more to talk about that later on. Cholesterol, we will talk more about that. Um, as you go to the right, you'll see hematocrit, erythrocyte deformability, and plasma viscosity. We'll talk more about that as well. Now, erythrocyte aggregation. Uh, erythrocytes are prevented from spontaneously aggregating by the zeta potential. And that's the electric potential, uh, the difference between the uh, surface of the red blood cell, which is negative, and the surrounding fluid. Uh, the erythrocyte has a, a, a lot of sialic acid on its surface. This imparts uh, a negative electric charge. That uh, attracts cations, which are sodium largely, and those sodium uh, ions themselves attract chloride anions largely. And so these anions, uh, these ions form a cloud around the erythrocyte, and this cloud prevents the closer approach of two erythrocytes. So uh, this zeta potential. Uh, prevents erythrocytes from spontaneously aggregating. Now, the zeta potential of erythrocytes is fairly low. It's uh, been measured to anywhere from negative 13 to negative 18 millivolts. In terms of classifying colloids, this is considered to be incipient instability, meaning that uh, uh, it's 
just on the brink of flocculating or aggregating. Um, it's uh, estimated that uh, uh, I think a value of negative seven millivolts is all that's required for uh, blood to spontaneous, erythrocytes to spontaneous ag spontaneously aggregate. At the opposite end, uh, a uh, zeta potential of greater or equal to 61 millivolts is considered to be excellent stability or to have a very minimal uh, tendency towards uh, spontaneous flocculation or erythrocyte aggregation. Now there's uh, several proposed mechanisms by which erythrocytes aggregate, uh, aggregate. The uh, probably the most commonly accepted model or idea is the bridging molecule. Uh, this tends to be uh, larger particles like LDL particles are larger proteins like fibrinogen, these can spontaneously aggregate uh, or spontaneously bind to the surface of an erythrocyte. They're large enough to spontaneously bind to erythrocytes and foster erythrocyte aggregation. So that's the bridging model. And uh, you can see right here is a stack of erythrocytes. Uh, it's called a rouleau in clinical parlance. Uh, that's a, a stack of erythrocytes that have aggregated. The other uh, mechanism which is proposed to cause erythrocyte aggregation is called the depletion attraction. And uh, if you can see, uh, we've got two colloids here, um, and uh, you can imagine those to be erythrocytes. If any two colloid particles approach each other closely enough, they will form a small uh, area between them in which larger particles uh, are excluded. Uh, and so this forms an osmotic gradient, which tends to drive these colloids together. Uh, and in blood, uh, I like to think of albumin as these smaller green uh, spheres and the, the red cell uh, as these larger brown red spheres. And so both of these are probably active in blood. Um, in dehydration, uh, erythrocyte aggregation spontaneously occurs. And I think that that is due to this depletion attraction. Now here's a picture of a fibrinogen molecule. As you can see, it's a long, thin molecule. It's got a diameter of about 40 nanometers. So it, it can easily bind to erythrocytes and cause erythrocyte aggregation. This phenomenon is uh, utilized clinically in a test that's called the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And this is used by clinicians to determine the degree of inflammation. And uh, this is largely a marker for how much fibrinogen is in the blood. Uh, this, these fibrinogen molecules are synthesized by the liver and in inflammation, cause spontaneous erythrocyte aggregation. These aggregates have a greater mass and tend to sediment more rapidly than individual erythrocytes that increases the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is basically the distance the erythrocytes fall in a set amount of time. There are also some other molecules, uh, immunoglobulins, uh, particularly IgM, which is the largest of the immunoglobulins. It can also cause spontaneous erythrocyte aggregation. And uh, the lower left hand, you can see a uh, depiction of LDL and HDL particles. LDL has a particle diameter large enough to uh, span the minimum intracellular distance between two erythrocytes and cause erythrocyte aggregation. HDL particles are too small and cannot cause erythrocyte aggregation. We're gonna talk more about that phenomenon 
later on. Uh, here on the lower right hand side, you can see a depiction of a uric acid molecule. You can see it's an anion at the physiologic pH. And uh, my group has shown that the elevated levels of uric acid can cause spontaneous erythrocyte aggregation. Here in this photomicrograph, you can see large aggregates of erythrocytes, which are stuck together solidly enough that uh, the currents caused by vibrations of the table, um, which the microscope that I made this picture from, uh, the aggregates are stable enough to withstand the currents caused by vibrations of the table. So you can see the individual erythrocytes have motion artifact uh, because of the vibrations uh, set up by the motion of the table. So these erythrocyte aggregates uh, are stable. Um, we think that uh, the uric acid molecules replace chloride anions in the uh, cloud surrounding erythrocytes. Uh, because a uric acid molecule has a larger diameter than a chloride anion, its charge density is lower than a chloride anion. And so we think that uh, replacing chloride anions with uric acid anions or urate molecules decreases the zeta potential of the erythrocytes. Uh, right now, uh, my group is focused on organic anions that tend to be elevated in renal failure. Uh, normally, organic anions are uh, excreted in the kidneys, but with renal failure, they tend to build up in the blood. And I think that uh, these, again, uh, decrease the erythrocyte zeta potential. And for this reason, what well, this is the cause of uh, the greatly increased risk of heart disease that uh, patients with renal failure experience. Uh, a lot of these organic anions are products of the intestinal, intestinal microbiome. And it's been shown that uh, different intestinal microbiomes or the bacteria that live in your intestines, different populations are associated with different risks of atherosclerosis. And I think that, uh, that the mechanism by which these, uh, the intestinal microbiome affects atherosclerosis is via these organic anions, these organic acids and their effect on uh, decreasing the erythrocyte zeta potential and uh, fostering erythrocyte aggregation, basically increasing blood viscosity at low shear rates. Now, uh, one might think that it might be a design error to have such a low erythrocyte zeta potential and such a uh, teetering on spontaneous aggregation all the time. I think the reason why is because there's two very common physiologic or pathologic situations where the hematocrit in focal areas approaches nearly 100%. And this would be very difficult, probably require a lot of energy to accomplish if erythrocytes had a larger zeta potential. And so in coagulation, uh, blood erythrocytes are packed very, very closely uh, and the hematocrit focally reaches nearly 100%. The same thing happens in post-capillary venules, small venules on the uh, distal side of the uh, vasculature, the other side of the capillaries, erythrocytes aggregate in inflammation and uh, basically block flow through these post-capillary venules. And that is helpful because it forces fluid and proteins 
to leak through the capillaries into the surrounding tissue in the inflammatory process. And so those two processes would probably require a lot of ATP molecules if the erythrocytes had a greater uh, zeta potential. As it is, uh, there's enzymes in the uh, erythrocyte cell membrane called scramblase, which uh, apparently uh, uh, without any input of ATP change the uh, zeta potential of the erythrocyte and allow these erythrocytes to spontaneously aggregate. Now, erythrocyte deformability is an important determinant of uh, blood viscosity at high shear rates. Erythrocytes are the most deformable biomaterial known. Uh, and so you can imagine that uh, a small defect and erythrocyte deformability uh, would, when added to 20 to 30 uh, trillion other erythrocytes, could cause a substantial detriment in blood viscosity. There are about 20 to 30 million circulating erythrocytes. And so the defect in erythrocyte deformability is going to be additive. And so uh, uh, Slight decrement in erythrocyte deformability can, uh, when added up among 20 to 30 trillion red cells, be a, have a substantial impact. Uh, normally, the erythrocyte is a biconcave disc, and it's going to uh, change to an ellipsoid uh, at high speeds, and this reduces drag. Uh, and de decreases the viscosity of blood at high shear rates. Erythrocyte deformability is also important because the diameter of, of an erythrocyte, about eight uh, microns, is larger than the diameter of most capillaries, which is going to be about three to four microns. So erythrocytes have to deform uh, to squeeze through capillaries uh, uh, every time they pass through the circulation. Now there's three major factors which affect erythrocyte deformability. Being a biconcave disc, there is an excess surface to volume ratio in a normal erythrocyte. If you uh, increase the volume without decreasing the, uh, er without changing the erythrocyte cell membrane, you will get a spherocyte instead of a biconcave disc. And without this excess membrane to volume ratio, that will decrease erythrocyte deformability. Erythrocyte cytoplasmic viscosity, uh, it's easy to imagine how this could impact erythrocyte deformability. The uh, major clinical scenario uh, in which this has an impact is sickle cell disease. Uh, sickle cell hemoglobin will spontaneously aggregate uh, when the oxygen tension drops, and these aggregates increase erythrocyte cytoplasmic viscosity and decrease erythrocyte deformability. For our purposes today, the most important factor which affects erythrocyte deformability is the elasticity of the erythrocyte cell membrane. Now, uh, uh, the, if you recall from uh, basic biology that cell membranes are lipid bilayers, the polar head of uh, the individual triglycerides are phospholipid mo uh, molecules. Or if the polar head is exposed to the aqueous uh, solution, either in the blood or in the cell uh, cytoplasm. Uh, and these, there are long hydrocarbon nonpolar tails. These can be very closely packed if the long chain of the hydro hydrocarbon is straight, and these uh, long chains can be packed closely. Van der Waal attractions are going to uh, increase adhesion between these molecules and decrease the elasticity of the erythrocyte cell membrane. 
Now, if these uh, hydrocarbon chains have a kink uh, caused by a cis double bond in the chain, um, that will lessen the degree of packing in the erythrocyte cell membrane, increase uh, the the uh, elasticity of the cell membrane and decrease viscosity. We're going to talk more about this uh, later in the talk. Uh, here you can see in the lower right hand corner a long chain uh, carbon chain with a cis double bond producing a kink in the uh, carbon chain and we, right next to it is a long straight carbon chain. Now, uh, with that background, we're ready to start talking about uh, the clinical applications of blood viscosity. Uh, the clotting complications of COVID have received quite a lot of uh, attention in the press. And uh, up until very, very recently, these articles by and large said the cause of this thrombosis is unknown. But as I uh, mentioned earlier in the talk, just this past Friday, there was an article in Newsweek which uh, mentioned that the blood of these COVID patients is thicker, and that's the uh, uh, common parlance for viscosity. The uh, biochemical changes in the blood of COVID-19 patients are beyond any changes that I've seen before. The changes are astronomical. For example, fibrinogen levels of 10 to 14 grams per liter are seen in COVID-19 patients with a normal being about two to four grams per liter. So this is sky high, this elevation. And uh, fibrinogen is a part of the acute phase reaction. It's an inflammatory, uh, it's a protein that's uh, synthesized and released from the liver during inflammation. Uh, COVID-19 causes such a massive inflammatory response that it causes these sky-high elevations of fibrinogen. Uh, fibrinogen is present in the plasma, so this, these sky-high concentrations are reflected in extraordinary elevations of plasma viscosity. Uh, as you can see here, uh, a level of up to 4.2 centipoise, which is the uh, unit of viscosity, one of the units of viscosity, uh, has been measured. And this was actually the study referenced in this Newsweek article. Uh, that is even higher than normal whole blood viscosity. Uh, it, I'm not a familiar with any reports of blood viscosity measurements in uh, COVID-19 patients, but if the plasma viscosity is this high, the blood viscosity is going to be much, much higher. And uh, this is why up to 49% of criti critically ill COVID-19 patients have thrombosis. Now, thrombosis is uh, a recognized problem in intensive care units, and that's why patients uh, uniformly are given thromboprophylaxis, which is usually low molecular weight heparin. This is a, a drug which prevents thrombo thrombosis, but uh, it's not sufficient in cases of COVID-19. And so that figure of 49%, that occurred in patients that were on thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. Uh, I like a quote from the late Professor Schmidt Schoenstein, uh, Schoenbein rather, who was one of the pioneers of blood viscosity. He envisioned increased blood viscosity as a pile of dried wood or kindling in a forest. Uh, all it takes is one spark to set up a conflagration with the, in the presence of all that dead wood. And uh, the, that's analogous to a spark, uh, our, our, uh, a, a spark causing this thrombosis uh, is uh, analogous 
uh, thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin can eliminate the spark, but it won't eliminate all the uh, propensity towards thrombosis caused by the increased blood viscosity. So I like the way he envisioned that. Uh, the kinds of thrombosis in the COVID-19 patients, uh, the most uh, deleterious is the pulmonary embolus, which is, uh, we'll discuss more about that uh, presently. Uh, that's uh, caused by deep vein thrombosis, which is the single most common form of uh, thrombosis in critically ill COVID-19 patients. Ischemic stroke is when uh, the blood supply to the brain is cut off, kills that part of the brain, and uh, that's a stroke. Myocardial infarction is the medical term for a heart attack. That's when uh, blood flow through the coronary artery is, through a coronary artery is interrupted that part of the myocardium is deprived of oxygen, dies, that's a myocardial infarction. Any artery can be uh, affected in this. If it's a artery to the intestine, you'll get necrosis or death of that part of the intestine. Uh, can cause a gangrene if it's a artery uh, supplying the lower extremity. Now, uh, Let's talk a little bit about deep vein thrombosis. These are not the veins that you can see by looking at the skin. Um, you maybe have seen uh, varicose veins, which are enlarged, distended uh, veins on the surface. This is a different problem. These are deeper veins that you can't see from the surface. Blood flow in veins is normally slow. Uh, and it requires uh, muscular contraction of the lower extremity to uh, push that blood back to the heart. And so patients that are sedentary, whether they're lying flat on their back or they're in a seat on an airplane over the Atlantic or even uh, military recruits standing at attention for a prolonged period of time, in all these situations, there will be stasis of blood flow in the lower extremities, which will predispose to uh, thrombosis. And if blood is viscous, that uh, predisposition increases. Now, if there's a thrombocyte forms, uh, uh, it causes a problem in and of itself, but it causes a bigger problem if part of that thrombus flips off and goes north and lands in the lungs. If uh, an embolus from the deep vein is large enough, it can totally block blood flow to the lungs. That's called a saddle embolus, and that's a cause of sudden death. Most commonly, the uh, emboli are smaller, and uh, they interfere with uh, a perfusion of the lung, oxygenation, so uh, the patient will be cyanotic or turn blue. Uh, the amount of oxygen in the bloodstream will decrease, uh, and that's called hypoxia. And uh, the risk factors you can see down at the bottom, immobility is uh, very, very important. Oral contraceptives uh, increase to thrombosis. Uh, and uh, also uh, hypoxia or low oxygen saturations tend to be a very big problem in COVID-19 patients. A lot of this is attributed to lung disease, but I think that a large part of it is just due to in incredibly high blood viscosity decreasing perfusion through the uh, alveolar capillaries and interfering with uh, gas exchange by that reason, for that reason. Now, how does COVID-19 cause this massive inf inflammatory response? Well, the coronaviruses have a genome of single-stranded RNA, and it just so happens that their genome is incredibly rich in guanine uracil uh, uh, nucleotides. And 
these uh, fragments of R, single stranded RNA, which abundant GU nucleotides, the, for example, the uh, uh, sequences GU, GU, uh, and uh, nucleotide sequences like those can bind to what's called toll-like receptor 8. And that's a, a receptor within a lysosome. And so if a, a single-strand uh, RNA with these GU nucleotides binds to the uh, toll-like receptor 8, it uh, sets off a path of inflammation, uh, uh, inflammation, which results in uh, expression of cytokines, particularly IL-6, interleukin-6. That's the cytokine which tells the liver to upregulate synthesis of acute inflammatory uh, reactants, fibrinogen and the like. And uh, so because the genome of COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is it's so high in uh, guanine uracil residues, uh, it causes a massive inflammatory response via this pathway, uh, causing the cytokine storm, hyperfibrinogenemia, and elevated plasma viscosity, as we've discussed. Uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine block this pathway. Now, who are the patients at higher risk for these uh, thrombotic complications in COVID-19? Of course, elderly patients, patients with COPD, that's uh, uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema caused by smoking, active current smokers, patients with diabetes are also at increased risk for thrombotic complications of COVID, and patients with elevated cholesterol all these patients have in common elevated blood viscosity at baseline. So even without the superimposed increases in blood viscosity caused by COVID-19, these patients uh, have elevated blood viscosity. It's just elevated that much more by COVID-19. Now, all these uh, groups of patients also are at increased risk of heart disease. Now, uh, heart disease is uh, commonly to perceived to be a very complex issue. You know, there's multiple risk factors. Some people say 300 risk factors are known for heart disease. You know, cigarette smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, hypercholesterolemia, you know the uh, list of usual suspects. And one might think with a disease that is uh, seemingly this complex, you would not be able to identify what started the so-called epidemic of heart disease. But that's not really true. The uh, epidemic of heart disease began in the U.S. in 1913, and between 1913, with the exception of the two world wars, there was a continuous increase in the number of deaths due to heart disease in the U.S. from 1913 till about 1968. And the reason why deaths due to heart disease started in 1913, why they took off, Crisco was released to the market in 1911. Crisco is a partially hydrogenated vegetable oil and uh, the partial hydrogenation process changes that uh, cis double bond, which forms a kink in the uh, carbon chain in a, a lipid molecule to a trans uh, configuration. And we're gonna talk about that more in a little while. But uh, in 1918, with the entry of the US into the First World War, there was a lot of effort at conserving food and rationing and the like. And that caused a drop in the number of heart deaths in the US. 
And then once rationing was lifted and food conservation was lifted and food production got back up to uh, normal, uh, heart disease increased. That increase was continuous until it was interrupted in World War II by more food rationing. And uh, there's actually uh, very detailed information on when certain foodstuffs were rationed and when those ration, rations were loosened. And uh, you can actually uh, correlate changes in cardiovascular mortality with individual changes in rationing of certain foodstuffs. Uh, the, the, the wealth of detail is available. The knowledge is that granular, uh, that each change in rationing is reflected in a change of uh, deaths due to heart disease. And uh, so I write about this in a paper, in an essay that I published on medium.com uh, called How Eating Too Well Hurts You or Managing the Diseases of Superabundance. And uh, it just so happens I published that a year ago today. Now, the fatty acids, uh, uh, as we talked about, partial hydrogenation changes the cis double bond to a trans double bond. And so you can see that the uh, long chain, the long carbon chain straightens out. That allows close packing of these uh, carbon chains, uh, increased van der Waals attractions in uh, lipids. This will increase the uh, melting temperature and uh, will change a liquid vegetable oil to a solid fat, as in Crisco. And so this uh, Crisco and the like uh, partially hydrogenated fats were very popular. They were cheap ways of producing solid fats from inexpensive uh, vegetable oils, much cheaper than lard. And uh, these became very, very popular. And uh, that is one of the most important causes of the epidemic of heart disease in the world. Uh, the uh, similar changes happened in the uh, U UK. Uh, Crisco uh, was introduced in the United Kingdom in 1908, and it's thought that uh, there epidemic of heart disease began in 1913. They, uh, their deprivation caused by the First World War was much greater than ours. Food shortages were much more severe. And so their, uh, their epidemic really didn't start until the 1920s. But uh, the first diagnosis of a myocardial infarction in a living patient in the United States was in 1911, the year that Crisco or trans fats were uh, introduced into the US uh, marketplace. Uh, heart attacks at that time were so rare that the term myocardial infarction is not mentioned in uh, Dr. Osler's textbook of medicine. He was uh, one of the uh, giants of medicine. Uh, it was not mentioned in the 1922 edition of his textbook. Uh, it was considered to be a disease of the upper classes at the time, but he did note it was becoming more common with about one case per year in larger metropolitan hospitals. And so in terms of man-made causes of harm, Trans fats are about number four behind warfare, air pollution, cigarette smoking, and that uh, is followed by trans fats as a cause of harm done to himself. Now, uh, some of the first research that I did was uh, looked at the uh, effects of LDL and HDL on blood viscosity. Uh, 
uh, as you might imagine, LDL being that large uh, lipoprotein particle, large enough to spontaneously bind to erythrocytes, increases blood viscosity. Uh, HDL competes with uh, LDL for binding to erythrocytes and decreases blood viscosity. I can't think of any other solute that decreases viscosity with an increase in con concentration. Of course, you can uh, add solvent and dilute any colloid solution and decrease its viscosity, but I can't think of any other uh, component besides HDL, which decreases viscosity with increasing con concentrations. And if any of you know uh, another molecule that behaves like that, uh, please email me and let me know. I'd uh, be very interested in that. Uh, to me, this is very strong evidence of the importance of blood viscosity and heart disease. The largest study of blood viscosity was the Edinburgh Artery Study. Uh, as far as studies go nowadays, it was not really all that large. Uh, and it showed that indeed blood viscosity was higher in people that had uh, serious major acute cardiovascular events. Um, and uh, hematocrit was higher, fibrinogen was higher, plasma viscosity, all of those things were higher. But uh, this study, unfortunately, did I think everything wrong. They measured viscosity at a very high shear rate, 300 inverse seconds, and they corrected for hematocrit to a hematocrit of 45%. Uh, blood viscosity measured in situ is gonna be very dependent on hematocrit. And so a large amount of the effect of blood viscosity on the risk of heart disease is lost if you normalize uh, blood viscosity to a hematocrit of 45%. And because heart disease occurs in areas of low shear, the effect of blood viscosity on the risk of heart disease is going to be minimized by measuring blood viscosity at that high shear rate. And we're going to talk more about that. Uh, here on this chart, you can see all the varied conditions that causes increased in blood viscosity. Uh, increased blood viscosity causes what's known as a mural thrombus, which is a thrombus that forms against the vessel wall. We're going to talk about the process of organization, uh, which leads to the development of an atherosclerotic plaque. Now, areas of low shear develop naturally in the arterial tree in association with changing arterial geometry. So I'm talking about curves, dilatations, and branches. So we mentioned that areas of low shear are normal in the venous system, but they also occur in the arterial system. Here in the mother vessel, you can see the symmetrical velocity profile of blood. The length of each of these arrows or vectors is proportional to the speed at which that particular column of blood is flowing. Momentum of this blood causes an asymmetric vo uh, velocity profile in the daughter vessels, creating an area of relative low shear and an area of relative high shear. These areas of low shear are prone to thrombosis and the development of atherosclerotic plaques. In these areas of low shear, endothelial production of antiplatelet molecules such as nitric oxide and prostacyclin is decreased. Uh, the lining, the inner lining of a blood vessel is called the endothelium. These cells are very metabolically and hormonally active, produce a lot of mediators which control the amount of blood that flows through a vessel. And uh, production 
is uh, modulated by shear, production is going to be decreased in areas of low shear, which is going to predispose these areas to thrombosis. Uh, this figure shows the various shear domains in arteries, normally about uh, 10 to 70 dynes per uh, squared centimeter. The atherosclerosis prone regions are going to have very low wall shear, but also notice that very high shear can also cause thrombosis. And we can see that clinically in uh, a stenosis caused by an atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, that's going to cause the blood flowing across it to uh, increase in velocity very greatly. That increase in velocity will activate platelets and cause a thrombus. Uh, shunts, which are placed in renal failure patients uh, for vascular access for hemodialysis, are also high velocity. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. This is a plexiglass model of the carotid bifurcation, which was uh, created by Koo and Giddens, and they subjected this plexiglass model to prolonged pulsatile flow. And what they found was debris accumulated in these regions against the wall because there wasn't sufficient shear to carry that debris away. So after prolonged pulsatile flow in these areas of low shear, uh, the debris accumulated because areas of flow separation occurred. Now, of course, a pla pla plexiglass model is going to be inelastic. Um, and so that's going to be one important difference from a normal vessel. But the carotid circulation is much less elastic than a number of other arteries. And uh, for that matter, the coronary arteries are practically inelastic. Now, when a uh, thrombus forms, uh, it can undergo the process of organization if it is not lysed quickly by uh, molecules such as plasmin, which uh, enzymatically chop up the fibrin molecules, which are uh, uh, developed from fibrinogen, the precursor in the coagulation process. Fibrinogen molecules polymerize to form fibrin, and that forms a large part of the clot, uh, along with erythrocytes. Plasmin is the normal enzyme which breaks up these clots, these thrombi. If there isn't sufficient plasmin activity, the thrombus can last long enough for it to undergo thrombosis. We earlier mentioned circulating stem cells. Those will be present in this, uh, this blood clot or thrombus. They can differentiate into uh, endothelial cells to form capillary sized vessels. They can also differentiate into fibroblasts, which produce collagen. And via this mechanism, they convert this blood clot into a fibrous atherosclerotic plaque. Here is an organizing thrombus. Barely visible are these capillary sized vessels. This is known as granulation tissue. And in this example, the thrombus has been largely replaced by granulation tissue, which gets its start from these circulating stem cells and eventually links up with this uh, circulation as a whole. And over time, this will cause this uh, thrombus to uh, turn into a collagenous or fibrous atherosclerotic plaque. Here we see the uh, organization processes almost finished. There are still some large vessels present here. Here's the lumen of the vessel. Now, uh, hemodialysis patients, as I mentioned, often have Dacron, artificial Dacron synthetic graphs placed for hemodialysis access. And this is one of those graphs. Here you see the Dacron mater material, which forms a shunt are an artificial vessel connecting an artery to a vein. Um, of course, the pressure in an artery is much higher than the vein, and so blood flow through this shunt is going to be very, very high velocity. It's going to activate platelets. 
And so these thrombi, uh, these shunts are very prone to thrombus formation. And this is an atherosclerotic plaque that developed in one of these Dacron grafts. And this is a, a clear demonstration that organization of neural thrombi results in an atherosclerotic plaque. Let's uh, quickly talk about how blood viscosity impacts aging. Uh, we've talked about elasticity in arteries. Um, this elasticity is imparted by elastin molecules, which are different from practically every other protein and that they are not continuously synthesized throughout life. Uh, synthesis of new elastin molecules ceases when growth ceases. So the, your entire allotment of elastin is present by about age 20. And that is when the aging process begins. Any material which is uh, uh, subjected to periodic deform deformation, stretching, uh, and relaxation will ultimately fracture and the material will fail. And this uh, elast elastin fibers are, behave no differently. Um, you can see loss of elasticity as wrinkles and sagging in facial skin. The same, pr uh, same procedure happens in blood vessels. And so blood vessels with this loss of elasticity over time become stiffer. Now, uh, increased blood viscosity is going to increase the resistance uh, to flow, which is going to increase the pressure within a vessel and cause uh, a greater uh, deformation with every pulse. Uh, and it's this deformation which contributes to the ultimate failure of these elastin molecules after repetitive deformation. And uh, this shows how uh, increasing blood pressure is uh, correlated with increasing peak blood velocity as the uh, blood vessel gets stiffer uh, because uh, collagen molecules are sequentially progressively recruited to bear wall stress once all the uh, elastin molecules have been uh, either fragmented and uh, failed, uh, but uh, this uh, progressive arterial stiffening results in increased blood velocity. And that is deleterious because uh, it increases Reynolds number, which is the number which denotes the propensity for development of areas of flow separation in any flowing liquid or gas for that matter. So the faster the blood flows because of aortic stiffening, uh, aorta being the main blood vessel coming off of the heart, the faster the blood's going to flow, the more uh, likelihood, the greater the likelihood for development of areas of flow separation and low shear. And those areas of low shear are predisposed to thrombus, atherosclerosis. And so this is one of the ways by it, how aging increases the risk of heart disease. Here's a picture of the naked mole rat, which is a real wonder of nature. Uh, most mammals have an allotment of about 100, uh, 1 billion heartbeats over their lifespan. If you're a, a mammal with a very high heart rate, like roughly 550 beats per minute as in a mouse, you're going to use up the, that allotment of 1 billion much quicker than, say, a whale, which is a heart rate of about 20 and a lifespan of 80 years or so. The mole, naked mole rat is an exception. It's probably got a, a two or three billion heartbeats over its lifespan, and it does not experience increased stiffening of its arteries. Uh, and so this is an area of active study. Why doesn't stiffening happen into the vasculature of the naked mole rat? Uh, it's got a lifespan that extends into the 
mid-20s. And in fact, the most common cause of death in naked mole rats is uh, uh, trauma inflicted by other naked mole rats. This saying is from Thomas Sydenham, who was an 18th century physician. A man is only as old as his arteries, and that's really true. Now, how do you treat increased blood viscosity? You, it's easy to imagine. Therapeutic phlebot phlebotomy, what used to be known as bloodletting. Um, and this was tried in a study of metabolic syndrome, which are the patients with increased glucose, uh, obesity, and increased blood pressure. By decreasing blood viscosity in these patients with therapeutic phlebotomy or bloodletting, it uh, decreased blood pressure and decreased serum glucose. That's because perfusion of skeletal muscle is improved with the decreased viscosity. This allows greater glucose uptake by myocytes, our skeletal muscle cells, and decreases the amount of uh, glucose in the blood. And the obvious way of uh, don't, uh, they're uh, losing blood uh, therapeutically is blood donation. And there's one study out of Finland, this was a particular population where the st uh, subjects were at very high risk of atherosclerosis, probably due to a high incidence of smoking and a, a, a diet that was high in uh, animal fat. And uh, the, this showed a greatly decreased risk of heart attack uh, in blood donors compared to others. Statistically, uh, the risk was reduced to about 0.12 or decreased 88%. Um, this study really needs to be reproduced. Uh, and I myself donate blood. Uh, the reason why blood donation decreases blood viscosity is that bre fresh, brand new erythrocytes are more deformable. Uh, as erythrocytes age, they become stiffer. I uh, don't know whether this is due to non-enzymatic glycation or lipid peroxidation, whatever the cause, they become stiffer over time. Uh, there is a surprising to me lack of interest. And I think that in blood viscosity, I think that that's uh, because of a bias among medical scientists towards genetics and uh, molecular biology over uh, a parameter as basic as viscosity. And uh, I uh, like to uh, use this quote to illustrate that. In the genomic era, readers may question attention given to a measurement as mundane as the hematocrit. And that was from a paper where therapeutic phlebotomy was used to treat a particular cancer of red blood cells called polycythemia vera. These patients have sky high hematocrits and uh, can die of thromboses, uh, as you might expect. The mainstay of treatment is therapeutic phlebotomy, lower the blood viscosity. And uh, the thrust of this study was that. Uh, Patients with a uh, viscosity uh, with a hematocrit of 40 did better than patients with a hematocrit of 45. And that's very simple, straightforward, easy to understand if you appreciate blood viscosity. Uh, some quotes by uh, I think the greatest physician all, of all time longevity is a vascular question. The tragedies of life are largely arterial. Uh, the greater the ignorance, the greater the dogmatism, and the philosophies of one age have become the absurdities of the next, and the foolishness of yesterday has become the wisdom of tomorrow. I like that quote because uh, I believe that one day uh, therapeutic phlebotomy or bloodletting is going to be a very important tool in preventing heart disease and treating COVID-19. And uh, whereas most people consider that archaic and um, something that uh, should be practiced by medieval barbers and not physicians, I think it's going to come back. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, 
thrombotic complications in COVID-19 are caused by elevated blood viscosity due to the massive uh, immune response to the virus. Elevated blood viscosity causes heart disease and viscosity is a fundamental uh, quantity of any fluid, including blood. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, Dr. Sloop, um, I sent you a list of questions in the chat. Um, if you okay, want to- Okay, I, I see that. Uh, there's a uh, question here for the viscosity value stated on COVID-19 patients. What shear rate was used? What is an ideal shear rate? Okay, uh, good question. That study, uh, it was plasma which was measured and it was in a capillary viscometer. And so uh, in a capillary viscometer, there isn't a single shear rate. Uh, the shear rate at the wall uh, can be uh, uh, derived mathematically. That was not uh, uh, listed in that particular publication. Um, Viscosity can be determined at a single shear rate using a cone plate or similar type of viscometer, but you can't uh, limit the shear rate to a single value in capillary viscometry. Uh, so uh, uh, I think to, to the second part of the question, if you're trying to determine risk of heart disease, you should measure at a lower shear rate. Uh, 10 inverse seconds or less uh, for other applications if you're interested in uh, impaired def erythrocyte deformability caused by diabetes or any other cause, I would measure uh, blood viscosity at a high shear rate. Grace, are there any other questions? Yes, um, if you can expand the chat Okay. There's there's a slew. I have at least um, there's been quite a lot of questions. So thank you everyone. Um, there's been at least about I would say eight to nine questions um, that I have kind of sent. Okay. Up. I see. Here we go. Okay. Okay. What equipment and measurement points have I used in obtaining the viscosity of blood. I used a Canon Fenske uh, capillary viscometer and the wall shear rate was about 110 inverse seconds. And of course, uh, the shear rate in the center of a column is gonna be minimal. And in the center of the column of my capillary viscometer, uh, the shear was low enough that I could visualize erythrocyte aggregations. They probably uh, grew to about half a millimeter in size. So there's, in a capillary viscometer, there's an infinite number of shear rates and shear rate is uh, maximal at the wall and minimal in the center of any column of flowing blood. Okay, will a realogic tack uh, rheological tag test be able to uncover potential clotting problems with blood. Um, I think what that's referring to is uh, uh, an instrument called the thromboelastograph or a TEG um, and that's used particularly by surgeons intraoperatively to uh, evaluate the cause of uh, bleeding difficulties in a patient? Is it due to uh, low fibrinogen levels? Is it due to aspirin? Um, I'm not really that familiar with the TEG or the thromboelastograph. It's not used that much in hospitals. Uh, question, we have studied the effect of viscosity with critical concentration of various salts and carbohydrates had serious issues. Any thoughts on this advice? I'm wondering um, 
if you're affecting the zeta potential uh, with your salts, um, you're going to be uh, adding anions and cations, and I think that could easily uh, change the zeta potential. And so that uh, would be where I would start uh, looking at that. Um, carbohydrates are going to long chain carbohydrates are going to increase blood viscosity um, and that could be due via the depletion effect and uh, i'm talking about dextran the higher the molecular molecular weight of dextran the greater the uh, impact on blood viscosity and uh, uh, that's uh the advice I would give you for that, uh, I'm not sure what uh, you, what particular issues you've got. So if you care to email me, I can uh, maybe help you more if you uh, uh, let me know what particular issues. Okay, what is the difference between heparin and citrate in preventing coagulation? Uh, Heparin binds to thrombin. Thrombin is the enzyme which causes cross-linking of fibrinogen to form fibrin in the clot. So heparin interferes with that process by binding to thrombin. Uh, citrate, I believe, um, binds calcium cations and uh, eliminates those. And uh, calcium ions are a cofactor in one of the uh, enzymatic uh, reactions in the coagulation cascade. I, I don't recall exactly, but that's, I believe, the mechanism of action of citrate. Okay, has increased blood viscosity in COVID-19 patients already been confirmed in clinical? Not to my knowledge. And I think that we definitely need to study blood viscosity. I think that it's, the elevations in blood viscosity are gonna be more astronomical and out of whack than the elevations in plasma viscosity. Uh, regarding the difference between LDL and HDL and blood viscosity, at what shear rates do you uh, recommend measuring at? That should be measured at low shear rates, um, 10 inverse seconds or less, preferably. Uh, I would use, I would avoid um, a cone plate or any of those type of viscometers which uh, use uh, two closely opposed surfaces because erythrocyte aggregates can be large enough that uh, the gap, the narrow gap between the plates in uh, those kind of viscometers would actually interfere with erythrocyte aggregation. And so if you're looking at that phenomenon, I would use, I would avoid uh, a cone plate or similar type of viscometer. So I would use, look at low shear rates. Can I repeat my comment about what happens to endothelial cells in low shear? Yes, uh, shear, uh, endothelial cells uh, synthesize nitric oxide and prostacyclin and a bunch of other molecules, but those two particular molecules have antiplatelet activity and thereby preventing thrombosis. Endothelial synthesis of these molecules is uh, modulated by shear. So increased shear increases production of these molecules. It decreased shear decreases uh, production and increases the risk of thrombosis. And that's one of the many reasons why decreased shear uh, areas are prone to thrombosis. What are ways we can reduce blood viscosity? Uh, I think blood donation is uh, the best way. 
um, you're helping yourself and you're helping your fellow man, um, your fellow human. I think that uh, blood collection agencies in every other country besides the U.S. promote the health benefits of blood donation. Uh, the U.S., uh, that is not the practice here. The um, American Red Cross purposely avoids promoting the health benefits of blood donation because they believe an altruistic donor is the safest donor. That if one donates blood to receive some benefit, they are more likely to uh, be a higher risk donor, uh, having uh, meaning that they've engaged in some risky behavior, for example, in the past. And so they, are, they want the purely altruistic donor and not somebody whose uh, threshold for donating is lowered because they think they might receive some benefit. That's the same rationale uh, Whereas if you're going to use uh, blood, uh, collect blood for transfusion, you cannot pay those donors more than a, a token amount. Okay, for a viscosity value stated on COVID-19 patients, what shear rate was used? What is it? Okay, I think I answered that question already. Uh, Thank you for the great presentation. Can you make a comment on how accurate cone and plate would be or if you have any experience in measuring? Yeah, of course I measured whole blood viscosity. I, um, I like capillary viscometers because my interests um, have been in erythrocyte aggregation and uh, heart disease and uh, because erythrocyte aggregation can uh, be, can happen, uh, can develop to its greatest extent in a capillary viscometer. I favor capillary viscometers. As I said, the uh, narrow gap between two plates and uh, a rotational viscometer, I believe can interfere with the growth of these erythrocyte aggregates and interfere with the uh, uh, measurement uh, of low shear blood viscosity. Does blood viscosity increase before COVID-19 symptoms become present? Hmm. Uh, I would say probably shortly before symptoms become present. Uh, in any viral infection, the number of viruses is greatest very, very early in the disease. And as the immune process proceeds, it decreases the number of viruses but increases symptoms. The symptoms in a viral illness are largely due to the immune reaction to that virus. So uh, there's going to be probably a slight window where you will have elevations of blood viscosity prior to uh, becoming prostate. Uh, prostrate rather from uh, the viral illness and becoming really sick. Probably a very narrow window, uh, but uh, in general, the immune response is going to correlate with the increase in blood viscosity and the increase in symptoms. And for that reason, the window where you will have an increase in blood viscosity before you have symptoms, I think is going to be small. Does increase in yield stress correlate to thrombosis in small vessels? Uh, 
Uh, are you referring, uh, well, I'm gonna assume that this is a yield stress of a thrombus and the, uh, uh, the answer is yes. Fibrinogen, lipoproteins, other molecules which foster erythrocyte aggregate, aggregates increase the yield stress of blood clots. Is there any hysteresis in shear rate dependence? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, I think you're gonna have to go back to very early uh, blood viscosity literature to find a discussion of that. I think uh, I would look at the world work of uh, Leopold Dittenfoss. Uh, he was an Australian and did a lot of work in the 1960s, I think through the 1980s, and that would be where I would uh, try to find out about hysteresis. I really don't know too much. I believe it, it does occur. Uh, is there any temperature dependence of blood viscosity in the region of possible human temperatures? Um, Viscosity is temperature dependent. Um, one of the things I've been studying very recently is uh, viscosity in Antarctic fish. Uh, these fish swim at uh, uh, water temperature of about negative one and uh, their blood viscosity is very similar to that of a human. Uh, and that's largely due to very low hematocrits in these fish. Uh, and there's a certain species of uh, fish down in Antarctica that has no red blood cells. And uh, it still has a viscosity uh, similar to that of humans. And I think the reason for that, I'm speculating, is because of the inhibitory effect of blood viscosity on Reynolds number. If a Reynolds number is too high, you're gonna get uh, hemolysis, damage of the formed elements of blood, activation of platelets, activation of neutrophils and the like. Uh, and you don't want that in a circulation. And so I believe that a minimal degree of blood viscosity is necessary for that reason, which is why these Antarctic fish with a hematocrit of zero still have a blood viscosity in the range of three or four or five, something like that. Uh, now, uh, in the temperature range relevant to human disease, uh, well, hypothermia is going to increase your blood viscosity and contribute to frostbite. Uh, I don't recall whether fever has any effect on blood viscosity per se. What I do know is that fever increases inse insensible fluid losses from the bloodstream and causes some degree of what's called hemoconcentration. Uh, it will slightly elevate your hematocrit. So my guess is that uh, the overall effect of fever is going to be to increase your blood viscosity. Uh, what kind of drugs can lower the blood viscosity? Any products in the market? Um, the Drug which is used most often is pentoxifilin. Um, I'm not sure how effective that is. And in fact, I believe the data are somewhat conflicting. They're not very good. Some statins decrease blood viscosity, but not all of them. And I think that's one reason why uh, statins don't really work all that well for coronary heart disease. Uh, there's a paper, I'm forgetting the author's name, uh, he compiled a list of 44 prospective double-blind placebo-controlled uh, 
studies of statins which showed no effect on cardiovascular morbidity or mortality in the use of cholesterol lowering drugs. So uh, that makes all the sense in the world if you believe that it's blood viscosity that we should be treating, not cholesterol. Um, I don't know uh, of any other drugs that can lower blood viscosity. I would imagine that a particle the size of an HDL particle ought to be able to drop blood viscosity. Uh, also, could I please make a few comments on abnormally low whole blood viscosity that may be experienced in certain anemic diseases? This is a very interesting question. Um, and I sort of alluded to it on the anemia of chronic disease. In a lot of types of anemia, the anemia is a homeostatic response to normalize blood viscosity. Uh, my group has called this uh, response the oh, uh, systemic vascular resistance response. Uh, increased blood viscosity is going to increase systemic vascular resistance and the body responds by lowering uh, hemoglobin concentration and vasodilatation to normalize uh, systemic vascular resistance. And so this is the cause of anemias uh, such as uh, hemoglobinopathies, uh, so we're talking thalassemias, sickle cell disease, the so-called anemia of chronic disease, chronic renal failure, the anemia of heart failure. All those anemias are compensatory to normalize blood viscosity. Systemic vascular resistance response. Uh, we've written a couple of papers about that. If a capillary viscometer measures an infinite number of shear rates, why is a single viscosity value reported? In that particular case, uh, uh, plasma viscosity was reported and uh, the non-Newtonian behavior of plasma is very, very, very slight. And so its viscosity is gonna have minimal dependence on shear rate. And so that's not really an issue in a capillary viscometer. And like I, I mentioned, uh, wall shear rate in that study, I don't believe was uh, listed. Uh, and as a technical point, uh, it, uh, they reported plasma viscosity in centipoise, but they measured it with a capillary viscometer. And unless you correct for the density of plasma, what they were really measuring was uh, uh, not a dynamic viscosity, but I'm blanking on the other term, and the proper units should have been stokes, uh, centistokes. So I'm not sure whether they did that correction or not, but they did report their values as centipoise. That single value viscosity should be associated with a single value shear rate. I want to know what that single value shear rate is. Uh, there is a formula to calculate the wall shear rate in any tube. And offhand, I don't know what it is, but it's in the paper that uh, described the uh, effects of LDL and HDL on blood viscosity. So if you can look that paper up, it's got that formula. Have I found any merit to measurements with falling needle viscometry, especially low shear rates? Don't really know too much about that method, sorry. What do I think about rotational rheometers? Uh, I think they're limited in assessing the impact of erythrocyte aggregation on blood viscosity. So not the biggest fan. 
the advantage, of course, is the ability to measure at one particular shear rate. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's attractive, particularly in getting papers published. Referees like to see that. Have I, uh, okay. Hi. I'm oh, sorry. Go what ahead. do I think of rotational rheometers? I just answered that question. Um, there's uh, one last question, Greg. So I'll go ahead and forward that to you. And then after, we'll, um, the time is probably going to be just about done um, for concluding. Okay. So if you want to review the last question that I just submitted for you. Okay. What does, does LDL lowering drugs like Lipitor? really help to lower the blood viscosity as well as risk of cardiovascular disease. I kind of answered that. Um, Joe Wiedemann wrote a chapter in my book on uh, the effect of statins on blood viscosity. Uh, I, I think Rose Suvastatin, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, decreases blood viscosity and some of the others have no effect or increased blood viscosity. Uh, the cholesterol ester transfer protein, uh, those uniformly increased blood viscosity. And of course, those trials were uh, halted early because of excess mortality. Uh, I've written a paper about that. Um, so, mm, I would recommend reading that chapter by Joe Weedman in the book. Uh, he talks about that. Thank you for that question. All right. Um, so, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and conclude. Uh, thank you, everyone. And also, a special thank you to Dr. Sloop for attending and hosting this webinar today. Um, I'll make sure that the presentation, as well as the recording, is all personally emailed to each of the attendees and anyone who has signed up and may not have been able to stay for the whole webinar. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, Dr. Sloop's email will be available as well, and then you can definitely and always reach out to the RioSense team. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for your time today, uh, and stay safe, uh, be healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Sloop. <laughs> thank you, Grace. Uh, 40 people hung out to the end. I'm impressed. <laughs> All right, um, great. I'm going to go ahead 